The following interview was conducted with Mary McCutcheon, the daughter of John McCutcheon, the head of the Chicago Tribune's editorial page and granddaughter of John T. McCutcheon, the, um, the science graduate in 1889 and cartoonist for the Chicago Tribune for a number of years, 1903 to 1944. It took place on Friday, April the 17th, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Mary, welcome. Thank Purdue. you. Let's uh, start with, tell us where, where and when you were born and a little bit about your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, I was born July 13th, 1947 in Chicago. Um, younger sister of Anne McCutcheon Lewis, who was born in 1943, and older sister of John T. McCutcheon III, who was born in May 1949. My um, parents met each other in New Orleans when my father was serving in the Navy, and I think they met in something like July of 1942. They fell instantly in love, got engaged something like October of 1942, and were married in February of 1943, one of those wartime romances. My sister was born a little less than nine months later, <laughs> and my father went off to the war in the Pacific Theater. And when he came back, my sister was two years old, and my parents um, moved to Chicago where my father was. Now, I believe that right after the war he got a job for City News Bureau. That would have been 1940. I don't think he got back until 46 because he went to Japan as part of the occupation um, from the from, uh, um, from the, the um, uh, VJ Day I suppose uh, until the end of 45. Um, so when he came back, they moved to Chicago and um, had a small apartment there, I think. And I was born in Chicago in 47. And then we moved right away to Lake Forest, where we lived in a house that my grandparents owned. My grandfather was then I think about 77 years old. My grandmother, a lot younger. My grandmother would have been only about um, 53, I think, at that time. There was a lot of a lot of uh, gap in their ages, um, and they had a house on Illinois Road, and they nicknamed it Bird Center because my grandfather had done a series of cartoons. At the t around the turn of the century, um, poking fun at, I think it was suburban life in Chicago, um, and he created a lot of these fictional characters that had adventures and comings and goings and went to polo matches and had golf games and lots of local gossip, and the name of that series was Bird Center. So we, I grew up in Bird Center and uh, lived there until 19... 57 when we were building a new house um, on Laurel Avenue but the house wasn't done quite yet and yet we had already gotten a tenant for Bird Center so in the interim we had to find some place to live so the family moved into the log cabin um, on Green Bay Road in Lake Forest and we got that log cabin through an interesting story 1933 there was a World's Fair in Chicago and the celebration was uh, among other things that was the life and times of, of Abraham Lincoln and it was a very progress oriented World's Fair and a, it tried to inject a little optimism into an otherwise pretty depressed nation um, and it was a pretty successful World's Fair and part of the Lincoln exposition had reconstructed houses at the various stages of Lincoln's life. So there was a, a copy, sort of authentic, if possible, birthplace. And he was born in Kentucky. And then there was the Indiana home. And then there was, an, I guess, a Springfield home or various different houses in the course of Lincoln's life. And my aunt, her name was Sylvia Shaw Judson, um, was enraptured with the Indiana home of Lincoln. 
because it was just about the right size for her to have a, a, a sculpture studio in it. She was uh, embarking on her career as a sculptor, and she needed a place that could be well lit with a skylight and have just enough space. And she also wanted to have a bathroom and a little bit of a kitchenette attached to the back of it, so she uh, scouted around the World's Fair to see what else they might be getting rid of, and she found Sally Rand, the famous striptease dancer, had a dressing, or you might say undressing room at the World's Fair also. So my aunt went to the administration and said, what are you going to be doing with these buildings after the World's Fair is over? And the administration said, I ah, will probably just throw them all out, get rid of them all. She said, well, then I want to buy both of these. So she bought the Indiana home, and she bought Sally Rand's dressing room, and she had them all disassembled and reassembled in Lake Forest, attached to one another. So we have Lincoln's Indiana home attached to Sally Rand's dressing room, and it, that itself became a conversation piece. She did bash a hole in the roof, which I look back on as a big mistake, but that was for her skylight, and she did work in there for many years. So when our house was not yet finished and we had to leave Bird Center, the whole family moved into the cabin. And we lived there that whole summer. We lived there until it got too cold. And my poor brother, who was then nine years old, his job was to chop wood, chop firewood. So we really did live the pioneer life. <laughs> and we kept the place as warm as we could, but pretty soon it just got too cold. So we moved in with my grandmother. That was 1958. And we stayed with my grandmother until the new house was finally finished on Illinois Road. OK, well, that's enough irrelevant material. That's enough material good. independent of the question. So yeah. let's go. We can go good. on to the next question. Where did semester. you go to um, high school then? And tell us about high school and grade school. OK. Yeah. Um, we had a very good public school system in Lake Forest. So um, my sister and I both went to the public schools until through the end of our freshman year in high school. But our family also had a tradition of going to Milton Academy, starting with my father. And both of his two younger brothers went to Milton Academy in Massachusetts. Um, my great-grandmother, my mother's, my father's mother's mother had gone to Miss Porter's school in Connecticut. So there was a family tradition of going there, too. So when I got to be 13, I was given some choices. I could have done anything. I could have stayed at the high school. Another choice was a very um, liberal school in Putney, Vermont. And then there was Miss Porter's, the very conservative, prim, white gloves school. And then there was Milton that was a kind of academically oriented. I chose to go to Milton. Was so, it going at that time? No, oh. it was called parallel education. That means there's a road, and both sides of the road, each side of the road had a school. The road was meaning parallel. Boys' school on one side, girls' school on the other. Because I knew it was as being a boys' school. It yeah. used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I don't know how, whether it started out being, having a girls' school at all, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, now it's totally co-ed. Um, but we had co-ed AP science classes, history of art, history of music, glee club, obviously, and drama, all the things that require boys and girls to be together or were just not cost-effective to have doubled, so. duplica duplicated, were co-ed. E everything else was separate. So I graduated from Milton in 1965. And then, around then, I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. I, that seems funny now because I didn't get very close to being an astronaut. And I decided that what I wanted to do was go somewhere where I had a halfway chance of working with the space program. And that was Rice University. So I went to Rice and um, started majoring in math and took all the prerequisites to going into the space program, like space science and I don't know, geology. And I can't even remember what I was doing. But it started becoming obvious that I wasn't going to be going anywhere in, in outer space. <laughs> so. I took some anthropology courses, too, and ended up loving that. 
I had a professor named Frank Hole who got me inspired to do archaeology and uh, in the meantime was earning money running a babysitting service and getting quite rich running my babysitting service. We were a clearinghouse for all the girls in the dorm uh, and all the faculty with their small children and um, we earned a lot of money just commissions on the babysitting jobs and a lot more money doing our own babysitting so that's uh, that earned me enough money to go to the Yucatan Peninsula for a spring break one year and uh, my mother came with me and it was a nice turning point in our relationship because up until then I had been a dependent and then all of a sudden I was an equal. We were going Dutch treat. And uh, we went to the Yucatan Peninsula. I knew a lot about Mayan prehistory. So I, we went to Chichen Itza and Uxmal and I lectured away. And also I spoke some Spanish. So we had a wonderful time. Did you spend the whole summer there? No, oh. spring break. Oh, spring break. Yes, okay. so it wasn't a long trip. But it was nice because uh, suddenly my mother in some ways depended on me. and. And in other ways, I depended on her. And so uh, it was a very, very nice time for both of us. So graduated from Rice with a degree not in math, though I did struggle through three full years, painful years, as a math major. But I did get my degree in anthropology in the end and started doing archaeological field work with the field museums to start with. It was funded by the National Science Foundation under a program for undergraduate research. Obviously, they don't have that anymore. It was with the days when there was money. So I did two summers um, in Vernon, Arizona, uh, doing archaeological survey of uh, Mugion uh, sites there in, in Arizona. Uh, and then I did some more archaeology um, the next spring in Texas, digging up uh, prehistoric coastal sites, interestingly in the shadows of NASA. So that's as close as I ever got to the space program, <laughs> was digging up prehistoric sites outside the walls of the Space Administration. Um, so then I graduated in 69 and went on to the University of Arizona for a degree in anthropology. A master's degree? Well, I started who knew what I was going to be getting. So I did get a master's with a specialty in archaeology. By this time I was doing field work in um, the Middle East too to learn about European Paleolithic sites and um, did some historic archaeology around Arizona and more prehistoric archaeology in Arizona. And then I got very, very sick with a lung fungus that I contracted on our site, along with probably two-thirds of the other people working at the site. We all got sick exactly at the same time in Arizona. A uh, nasty disease. So the doctor said, quit digging, quit breathing dust. So I said, well, that pretty much is the end of my career as an archaeologist. But it was also a good, good excuse because I was beginning to get a little bit tired of the dead people and I'm a gossip and a busybody and have a giant nose. So what I wanted to do was find some real living people whose lives I could insinuate myself into. So I switched from archaeology to cultural anthropology. And that was a pretty easy switch because in the United States, archaeology and cultural anthropology are both under the same larger heading of anthropology. I did get very interested in physical anthropology and linguistics, too. I got in interested in all those things. And then um, picked my field site. I'm, I'm no fool. I picked a tropical island with palm trees and lobster to eat and friendly folks out in Micronesia. <laughs> so I went to the islands of Palau. And for very interesting family-related reasons, I think people don't just get interested in things out of the blue. I think there's always a germ of something that grows in your mind that compels you to pursue certain research interests. And my family and my grandfather, uh, John T. McCutcheon, w were instrumental in my getting interested in land ownership. 
especially corporate family land ownership, um, and how it tends to disintegrate. And um, in Micronesia, and in most places where they had a non-monetary economy, land would have been owned by a group of people, kin group, who shared the produce from the land and had no mercenary interest in the land except uh, if there was any kind of market value to produce. And before there's mon money in an in a economic system, there is no market value to produce. So uh, it goes along quite nicely and c congenially. And then pretty soon money is introduced into the economy and crops are grown for surplus and for commercialization and pretty soon the land itself ends up having a commercial value. And before you know it, family owned, kin group owned land tenure, kin group land tenure disintegrates and people begin to clamor for individual interests. And that's what I was interested in and remain interested in. And mm -hmm. So I did research on agriculture, market gardening, fisheries, commercial fisheries, and land ownership and resolution of disputes in this village in, in uh, Micronesia. So that's the story of my life. Well, that's the story of my early life. How long did you stay there? Um, my first y year was a year. Okay. And then I uh, came back when I worked at the Smithsonian. I worked at the Smithsonian after that, um, writing my dissertation, and then got a job back out there again. Guam. So um, I was the Palauan student's advisor or something at the University of Guam and went back to Palau a lot during those years. Then I came back again and just slipped right back into the Smithsonian after my Guam career was over and went back to Palau for various different reasons. I went back as a, a museum consultant once and I went back to finish up some field work various different times, and I went back for pure fun a couple of times. Oh, that's so, great. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Let's talk a little bit of some reminiscence. Talk a little about your, your father. Okay, my father, born in 1917. Um, I think he was born in Chicago also. My grandmother was way, way younger than my grandfather, as I said before. She was 22 when they got married. He was 46 or something. And um, so my father was born, um, don't know too much about that. Mm -hmm. I think there was a little si a sister that they had who was born anencephalic. And she lived only a week or so. And she died. Then my uncle Shaw was born. I think he was born in 1920. Not sure about that. And then my uncle Barr was born. And he was born in, I think, 20... Shoot, I don't know. Um, 26? That's, I don't know. I can't remember when he was born. Yeah, a good deal younger than my mother and my uncle. Um, so then they, so they raised three sons. And, um, they lived in Lake Forest? They didn't live in Lake oh. Forest. Um, they lived in Chicago. I think in the summertime, that's when people went to Lake Forest. It was a summer place. And even though the railroad had gone in long earlier and there was plenty of, it was perfectly easy to live there and commute to Chicago, um, most people didn't. They lived in Chicago and then went to Lake Forest for the summer. And I don't even know where they lived when they went there in the summer anyway because um, my grandparents didn't build their house on Green Bay Road, 1272 Green Bay Road, until well into the 30s or so, because the architect of that house was my grandmother's youngest sister's husband, and they didn't even get married until the mid-30s. So before that, where my father and his brothers and my grandmother and grandfather went for the weekend I can't or summers I, I couldn't say unless it was Bird Center or unless it was Ragdale which was my grandmother's parents house but that would have been a little bit crowded because my grandfather my great-grandfather didn't die until 1926 
and my great grandmother um, also made the trek from Chicago to Lake Forest. They also did the same thing, Chicago in the winter, Lake Forest in the summer. And they would have had their youngest daughter living with them. And I don't know if there would have been room for this young family to come crashing in every summer. So that's a good question. Where did they go in the summer? I don't know. Right. Okay. And then uh, talk a little also about your grandfather. One of the things that I'm interested in is he was involved with the Tribune. And, but your, the island retreat down in the Bahamas, did you go down there? And, and uh, every year, okay. yes. Every year we went there. He bought that. I can start a little earlier. The right. story, your, the story is quite interesting. That, My you? grandfather, right. yes, the Purdue alum, bought that island. Growing up, I think, in, in um, Tippecanoe County, Indiana, must make a, a young person dream of something exotic. <laughs> and my grandfather um, was a well, not exactly a farm boy because I don't think his family grew anything. His his father was a pig drover and a girl's dormitory supervisor and a sheriff at one point. So mm -hmm. there wasn't really agriculture in that family, but uh, you could say sort of in a general sense he was a rural quote unquote farm boy who dreamed of um, things like pirates and adventure and the tropics and um, climbing mountains and all the things that you could never do in central Indiana. So some of his um, recollections are put in the form of cartoons that he did you know, 20 or 30 years later. We nicknamed these the boy series. There's the boy of summertime, the boy of fall time, the boy of winter time the boy of springtime and in those there's a very strong autobiographical thrust to them it's a boy dreaming of things very often dreaming of the girl next door dreaming of the apple that's growing on somebody else's tree and dreaming of being a pirate and some of his one of his uh, the cartoons I like the most is the boys are are hanging around on a raft that they've built and it's of course floating on the Wabash and the girls of course are looking with you know, their thumbs sticking in their mouths and their their rag dolls clinging to their rag dolls in terror as the boys pretend they're pirates and I love that and, and on board the boat of course is a dog and some turtle and, and there they are on the Wabash so as my grandfather got older and went to Chicago. This passion for tropical islands really did um, take over, and he he realized that it didn't have to be a dream. He could make it really happen. So he scouted around for an island. Um, around the same time, now this is interesting to me as an anthropologist, because he had some friends from Chicago and from I don't know where he knew these people. And they had a woman friend. Um, oh, now I'm forgetting her name. Um, this is terrible. Well, I didn't take That's up right. time trying to remember her name. She was an aspiring anthropologist and in her, in her uh, 20s, I guess. They took her along to, to the Bahamas and to Haiti and Dominican Republic. Um, and they called it the Pirate Cruise. They chartered a boat and they went around. And somewhere um, on Andros, for some reason, my grandfather and um, the woman whose name I can't right away remember, ended up there together. Um, and I don't remember exactly what they did on Andros, but then they got, somehow they got to Haiti and they hiked from Port-au-Prince to Cap Haitien, or the other way around, Cap Haitien to Port-au-Prince, I don't know, on foot. And that's a, that's a rugged trip. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in those days. <laughs> in, 19, in 1971 or 72, I can't remember, my father proposed that he and I should take a trip. And I said, well, that's a good idea. And he, he asked me where I wanted to go. I said, well, I want to go to Haiti. 
and I want to go to, I didn't mention Dominican Republic, but I said Haiti and Puerto Rico. And so he said, all right, we're going to go. So we found ourselves in Haiti, and we took the Haitian Air Force to Cap Haitien, and we were stranded up there with no way to get back to Port-au-Prince except the public bus. So we hopped on the public bus, communicating in French, which most Haitians more or less speak, and that was the most fascinating trip I ever took. On the public bus from Cap Haitien to Port-au-Prince, we stopped at Gonaïve, and that was the rest stop. So we said, of course, well, where's the, where are the bathrooms? And they said, bathrooms. So we went on the side of the road like everybody else, got hopped back into the bus, <laughs> And I couldn't help but think this is the same route my grandfather took in 1911 with his friends and the woman whose name I can't remember. So, um, so that really sort of connects the stupid. stories. Yeah. And uh, then he got nothing but more and more fascinated by 1911. And he explored the idea of buying an island on the north of, of Australia called Melville Island where incidentally the Tiwi tribe lived. And the fact that it was already occupied by indigenous people didn't seem to phase him as the purchaser, potential purchaser, nor did it phase the potential seller, um, because that was the attitude back then. If people didn't stake a claim to land, if they were hunter-gatherer people, they didn't have ownership rights in land and had no authority to sell or, or what. So buying an island complete with indigenous people was something he really almost did. And I'm grateful that he didn't for various reasons. First of all, it poses a huge moral problem. Secondly, it was very far away. And how was he going to go? This was before air, air flight was much. Um, by this time, I think it was around 1913, 1914. I don't remember what year it was that that little episode occurred. Um, you couldn't just get someplace easily enough, so how he was thinking of spending vacations on Melville Island, I don't know. Also, there are poisonous um, snakes, and there are crocodiles everywhere, and there are very, very poisonous jellyfish. I don't think it would have been a hot vacation spot. But that never happened. So then his um, his future uncle-in-law. He was at that point engaged to my grandmother. By 1915, he got engaged to my grandmother. And uh, he had already been good friends with her father, who was a contemporary of his. Don't forget, he was 24 years older than she. And so her parents and her mother's um, sister and her mother's brother-in-law were his very good friends. They were his peer group. So his future wife's mother's brother-in-law or uncle was named Charlie and uh, Charlie Atkinson. And Charlie Atkinson took a trip to the Bahamas one time and wound up somewhere, somehow learning that an island um, six miles north of New Providence, where Nassau is, was for sale. And I, I'm confused about who was selling it. It was either Van Winkle or one of these names that I, I should remember, was selling this island complete with a house and um, China service for 125, and it just seemed beyond belief. So he conveyed this news back to my grandfather, and my grandfather said, well, I believe I'm going to buy it. And Uncle Charlie might have said something like, well, aren't you going to look at it first? And my grandfather said, no, I'll take your word for it. So my grandfather bought the island in 19, maybe it was 1915 or 1916, I don't know. My grandparents were married in 1916, or were they married at the beginning of 1917? I don't remember when they were exactly married, but this was their wedding trip. So off they to went the island. for the first time, the honeymooning couple, <laughs> and uh, to, uh, by all accounts, they got there and were completely um, taken with 
this. It was beautiful. There were indeed place setting for 125, and there was a whole staff there waiting for them, greeting them. That um, came with the staff too? Well, the staff were employed, and my grandfather would have, could have, I guess, said take a hike, or he could have said, you still, you still have jobs, cooks and laundresses and boat people and a whole fleet of sailboats and dinghies of various sizes and a whole lagoon that in the old days had been used as a salt flat. And um, it was, I think, a natural feature on the island, which is uh, made of aeolian limestone. It's a, a kind of a glacial uplifting thing. Uh, during the Ice Ages, everything was dry land around there. And these were old coral reefs from some earlier time that were uplifted. And as the, uh, wa the sea level rose, some of the I that's where the islands of the Bahamas come from. They're what was just uplifted from earlier time periods, all very, uh, rel very old limestone. So Nassau and and Andros, a lot of these islands have what appear to be cliffs, and these are just uplifted areas. Then there's a very deep area called the Tongue of the Ocean that uh, goes between New Providence and uh, Andros, and uh, comes. Now, where would that be with respect to our island? I think it's the tongue of the ocean begins to come in from the deep Atlantic north of where our, our island was. Um, so it's interesting geologically. It's very interesting. And it makes for a very beautiful place because you have the sense that there's a cliff and there are caves. And yet there's very good um, soil for, well, it's not good soil. I shouldn't say that. It's very calcareous soil. but. In places, there's enough humus so that you could grow a little of this or a little of that. Sure. So, coconuts did well, and hibiscus and casuarinas, like everywhere, do well. And so, they must have been very taken with this. And um, so, we went there every single year. My grandmother, my grandparents went there uh, every year for. I don't know how my grandfather got his jobs done, but he managed to get to that island for two or three months every year. Um, and my grandmother, after my grandfather died, continued to go for three months every year between January and uh, March or April. And all of us kids went there every year whenever our spring vacations were. And we played hooky, something awful. We would sometimes go for three or four weeks on end and just not go to school. And I remember our teachers would just give us the math book and say, well, by the time you come back, we will have done the chapters <laughs> 16, 17, and 18. <laughs> and I don't remember spending too much of my time doing my math homework <laughs> while I was down there. So I was a pretty haphazard student. <laughs> um, but we got away with it. Um, I just uh, love that place and uh, lots and lots of memories of the songs we sang, the games we played, the shell hunting. But lots of fun. And you could lots take, they had the boats and you could go out, did you go out in the lagoon too? Using well the, the lagoon was a small lagoon. Oh, okay. In terms of acreage, it's hard for me to estimate, maybe three acres in size and not deep anywhere. So um, we had swimming. fish crawls there. Mucky bottom. If you mm. didn't mind a mucky bottom, yeah, you'd swim there. My grandmother swam there every morning. She'd get up at sunrise and go down and take a bath in the lagoon. The advantage of the lagoon was it was warmer than the other mm -hmm. um, bodies of water because it was sunbaked and it was a uh, the only opening. At, I was telling the story of how it was a salt flat which is why the island became known as Salt Key, its technical name, Salt Key. But someone blasted a cut so that the water could pour in from the outside and fill the lagoon. But still, it had a, its only flow of water was tidal flow um, four times a day, in, out, in, and out. And so you'd have long stretches of time where a relatively still body of water was just baked by the sun. Yeah. So it was a warm place to yeah. swim, and there were critters there, including um, sea urchins and octopuses and all kinds of critters that liked to live in still waters. There was even an area that had mangrove, 
My, my uh, um, great-grandfather, Howard Shaw, um, was an architect, and his final work before he died in 1926 was a tower, a pirate's tower, sort of tipping his hat to the pirate theme that my grandfather loved so much. And he built that on the edge of the cut. So you could climb it, and you can still to this day climb it, and look out and see as far as Nassau, six miles away from the top of the tower. So it, it was a nice place to swim if you didn't mind muck, but better places to swim were sandy beaches where there was surf and sure. uh, shell hunting and things like that. We harbored the boats in the lagoon. Um, there was a dock there. We had fish crawls, so you could get fish and you just dump them in the crawl and they'd stay alive for, you know, five or six days until you had a party you needed to have some grouper for or something. Uh, what else did we have at the lagoon? That was all you could, exploring the edges of the lagoon was something you'd do if you really wanted to turn over a rock and find some cool invertebrate under there. <laughs> yeah. you, is it still, in the, do you still have it? No. Oh, okay. We sold it in 1979, I think. My grandmother died in 1977. Around that time, there were situations that made it um, painful to either to own, of course, painful to sell it too, but um, the pain of owning it, I think, was outweighed the pain of selling it from the point of view of my father and his two brothers. Uh, labor was a problem, and by that time, illegal Haitian immigrants into the Bahamas was a huge problem. The Bahamian government wanted to crack down on illegal uh, immigrants, just we all know what it's like to have illegal immigrants, and you don't want to give them jobs illegally, preferentially to the local people who are legal, and yet the Haitians were very dedicated workers. And so one of the things we did was hire some Haitians, and this caused some problems, and you know, looking back, it, probably not a good thing to, to have done, but then there was uh, an episode where somebody pulled a gun on somebody else, and um, my sister was there at the time, and she, and with her little children, and she was absolutely panicked about how out of control things could get. Whenever we weren't there, things happened. Um, at some point, a boat blew up, exploded, and uh, my Second, my first cousin once removed was there at the time. I don't know the circumstances of that. Somebody else tied up a boat at high tide. This was an inexperienced, someone who'd never lived on a tropical island, obviously, tied the boat up at high tide using a short rope. Tide went out, of course. Tide came in again, and by that time, the boat was awash and the engine was ruined. Uh, what other disasters? Every time a hurricane hit, there was some damage. Things were always happening, and it was just nothing but uh, one trial and tribulation after another. So after my grandmother died, the two brothers decided it's really better to divest ourselves of this. And of course there was a lot of gnashing of teeth, and my generation was generally against it. I wasn't against it because I had at one point found myself there trying to solve problems. Um, I had just barely become anything resembling an adult at the time, and they said, okay, you're going to go down there and you're going to resolve all these problems. You're going to make insurance claims for the boat that blew up, and you're going to make an insurance claim for the boat that sank, and you're going to change the pay schedule for the staff. and." you're going to do this and you're going to do that. So I had this long, long list of chores. And it hit me then that this is not an easy job. And somebody's going to be mad no matter what you do. And something's going to, you know, you know buying supplies at the hardware store and PVC pipes. And, you know, it's not a vacation anymore. And um, when you're the younger generation, you often don't realize what goes into running a place like this. And that was my learning experience. So when, um, after my grandmother died, selling the island to me was not, it was a painful decision, but it was an obvious decision. To other people in my generation, 
it was too painful and not that obvious. And so there was controversy within our family of whether to sell it or not. Eventually, we did sell it, and it was bought by a German uh, guy who, whatever he, I don't know what he does. I think he runs a, a chain store or something in Germany. And he, I think he's still alive, and I think he still owns it, and uh, I think he's turned it into a tourist place. It's the destination for the Carnival Cruise Line, people who send sometimes in the course of a single day, in the height of the Carnival Cruise Line um, time period, I think 4,000 people would go there in, in, a, in the course of a day. These just regular boats back and forth, and everybody drinking a lot of rum, and doing the limbo and whatever else they did, playing, playing uh, uh, a lot of rhythmic music. <laughs> it was pretty appalling. I went there one time to visit, and we have to go in a minute? No, no, I'm just, okay. Okay. well, well you know, go ahead. here I am yakking away. Uh, I went there one time to just to see what it was like, and the very first question I asked, now remember that this is an aeolian limestone I owned. My question was, what do you do about sewage treatment? <laughs> My host, the German guy, was quite offended that I should ask a question <laughs> like this. But it's still, and I never got a satisfactory answer. Now, just go figure. A, a low island with lots of these sort of porta potties all over the place, scattered all over the place, highly porous substrate rock. Everybody is swimming um, 40 feet away from the out porta potties or outhouses or whatever these sort sure. of, sort of t crude toilet facilities were. You'll just think about that for a second and you don't want to go anywhere near that water. So um, I think the island is ruined now. Um, it would take a lot to, of tidal flow to wash away that E. coli infestation. Um, a storm blew the island literally in two. It severed the island. So now the lagoon is, has two entrances and egresses for the water. So the water will flow totally through the lagoon. And that killed the uh, mangrove because mangrove needs a certain amount of calm, still conditions, and so no more mangrove. They've made the lagoon into the home for flipper or whatever. There's always a flipper. There's no true original flipper, but that that uh, dolphin is some dolphin is living there, and you can have the flipper experience. Uh, you can also climb the tower, um, which is still there, thanks to my brother, who's a genius engineer and got the most in durable pressure-treated lumber he could, and built a staircase, which now. 30 or 40 years, I think it's been about 40 years, that thing is still in great condition. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, the tower is still there. The main house with the 125 place settings of China, all gone. Um, some things the house are, is just not there. Yeah, I think the termites got it and they bulldozed it away. It's just gone. Nobody cared to preserve it. To us, that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, now they have big old places where you can... Um, sing Bahamian Caribbean songs and listen to music and drink rum drinks. And I'm not even sure if the Carnival Cruise Lines even go there anymore. It's who knows. Yeah. It's history. Yeah. Um, one of the things, of course, you, you've got we've got the Crutchin cartoons that are here. Good. You know, Good. Get a They've been here for quite a while. Do I think originals are here. Of course, when you're, you have a career as a cartoonist and you're supposed to make a cartoon every single day and your career lasts 40 years, there's a lot of cartoons out there. There are some at the, what, the Newberry? Yeah, Newberry um, Historical Society, Syracuse, Syracuse University oh, for some reason. They have a fascinating collection. I figure out why Syracuse, but they have a lot of cartoonists who are preserved there. All of us kids have cartoons. Um, and there have been times when we're just literally sort of shoveling away cartoons, trying to figure out who to give them to. I think the McCutcheon High School may have some. I think the dorm here may have some. Um, you really got a lot. Uh, I have. I don't have that many because it's, you know, just m managing them and framing them and keeping them is a chore. I like to, um, I made a, a, a 
business of trying to grab the ones relating to aviation because my grandfather was passionate about aviation and that here at Purdue, what is it about this place that seems to produce people who are passionate about aviation? Right. But he graduated in what, 1889? Nobody even thought of anything but a balloon back then. That's right. Um, and yet as soon as uh, he heard about Orville and Wilbur, he just became absolutely passionate. And he flew um, over Grant Park in 1911, knew Orville, there's correspondence between him and Orville, which I'm very excited about. Um, as soon as he could, I think he flew in anything like a commercial plane. He, he and my grandmother flew across the Andes in 1928. I think he flew in France in uh, just after World War I. Um, he was just, just loved it. Took the Graf Zeppelin across the Atlantic in 1935. Um, and I've read, I've heard Loved that. aviation. So uh, if I found a cartoon that was going begging and it had anything to do with it, it had two wings and a propeller, I grabbed it. So on my wall right now, there's one about Lindbergh flying the Paloma to Mexico on a diplomatic trip. And uh, that's on my wall right now. Maybe I'll go home and switch it out to something <laughs> else. And, uh, what is your career path? Are you current, uh, what are you doing currently? No. I'm a retiree. Oh. That's my career right now. Okay. Any, anything special with your activity? Sometimes I ask people. Oh, I do know. too many things. Oh. But, uh, but when I came back from Micronesia, I went into museums and academia. That was it. So the Smithsonian for many years. I did uh, some exhibits there and did some international activities and uh, knocking out uh, research protocols with other countries and things like that. Um, then I um, managed a small archive at the Smithsonian on tropical island biogeography, a great thing I've always loved and um, then taught at George Mason University where I taught for 12 or so years. What did you teach here? Anthropology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I ran a little field class to the Bahamas of all places in 2005, no, 1995, was that about, no, 1996, did a field school in the Bahamas and it was really like coming home again. But that field school was in Andros. I had a lot of fun doing that. Still keep in touch with my students from those years. Um, and um, what else? I became, became very interested uh, as an anthropologist. My work um, started out after I quit being an archaeologist and began to focus on land ownership. I should explain that owning the island in the Bahamas and owning Ragdale, our home in Lake Forest, and trying to keep it in the family, quote unquote, has been a compelling um, idea for me. Is it possible for kin groups to share ownership of something without falling apart? And I think we did kind of make it happen in, for the island, but there were little things that happened, people not sharing certain interests, and one person more into boats and the other person more into caves and the other person uh, wanting a little more um, staff and somebody else wanting less staff. and the. The potential for disputes is always there. And when I went to Micronesia for the first time, that was exactly what I wanted to look at with somebody else. I'm going to say, I've got this particular interest because of personal, for personal reasons. So I want to study this for impersonal reasons and get an idea of how other cultures manage something like that. Well, in Palau, what I learned is that people get into fights. That's what happens. And they fight and they fight. Now my very own family in Palau, the one I was adopted into, is embroiled in a fight that I, makes it impossible for me to go back right now. I would be asked to take a side. And this is just terrible. So my own family, my own grandfather, probably led me to the career path I eventually took. Um, so... 
that's that. And um, teaching anthropology, though, got me derailed from that idea a little bit into the subject of um, evolution and creationism, because even at the most urbane campus, you're going to find a few people who are biblical creationists and resist evolution. And I became very interested in why people cling to that notion. So I'm now, in my retired years, going around lecturing on what it is about creationism that seems to attract people so much and, and, and keep people in the, quote, fold. So I give these lectures on this subject. I'm interested in apocalyptic religious beliefs, too, because I see in, you know, in our time here in 2009, we have a lot of things that um, seem contrary to a 21st century mentality, but are out there belief in apocalypse, belief in, in magic and Things like supernaturalism that, yeah. and <laughs> creation. And I want to find out what it is that keeps people believing these things in the face of obvious contradictory evidence. So, And I fly airplanes. I fly for Angel Flight, which is a, a charity to take people who have very rare diseases or very or things that require um, specialists. And they come from maybe rural areas or distant places and have to get to their doctors. So I do a lot of that. And I've been, various times I've been passing over Indiana, have been doing angel flights here and there. That's yeah. really what about an outs in, uh, outstanding event that you'd like to share? Any special? I don't event? know. I guess all kinds of events are outstanding. I know. There are too many outstanding. Yeah, I right. think that things like not e immediate event, events, not um, cataclysmic moments or something like that are not so important to me, but germs of ideas that get planted in my mind and grow and become part of me, such as my land ownership interests and my flying interests. So why did I get interested in flying? I don't know. Hard to, hard to know why I wanted to go into the space program. And so I didn't go to the moon, but I fly a Cessna. Right. Which is really good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, Mary, I want to thank you very much. This has been well, very good. Well, okay. I, really I hope enjoyed. this has yes, been a lot, of, a lot of crazy stories. Very good. Yes. Thank you.